Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How are you guys doing this evening? Turn the heat down a little bit. Well, it is late this evening. It is 3.59 a.m. And um, I literally just got up like 15 minutes ago. I was sleeping so good. And right next to me, well, of course, it was my husband and both of my dogs, but right next to me was little Boo Radley. And he was in, like, he was so tight. And he was in this area of the blanket that, like, we have this real puffy blanket. And um, it, he, he had, like, somehow made it. And it was, like, a nest. And he was, like, sitting in the middle of the nest. It was so cute. Where is my lip gloss? Did I not put my lip gloss back in here after I made my book? Here it is. Um... I was sleeping so well, and um, I woke up, and I have to say, <laughs> I have a few complaints this evening. Do you want to hear some of my complaints? Hold on, let's, first of all, I have my glass with ice in it. Would you like to hear my complaints? I will tell you my complaints. My first complaint is, that my allergies are off the charts. I'm gonna lock my door so that none of the uh, murderers and killers and serial killers come and get me. Um, yeah, my allergies have been driving me crazy today. Even though I took my allergy medicine, my allergies are still driving me crazy. So there's that. And then, my second complaint of the day is that I get so tired so early. I feel like I'm just tired all the time. I don't know what it is. And earlier, after we were watching TV and eating, I was like, because I didn't even lay down until midnight tonight. I laid down like right at midnight and I told Alex, I said, I'm just gonna lay down for like an hour. And I was gonna get up at one and vlog, and then I was gonna listen to my audiobook and I was gonna watch some TV. Um, and I knew, like I knew if I lay down, first of all, my sleep schedule is all over the place. And I kind of, like, I've said this before on here, I really don't care, honestly. Like, I've been getting up between like one and two. The thing is, is like, I get up at two and I still get everything done that I want to do for the day. So I'm like, <laughs> like I was talking to Tanya today and she's like, I just can't even fathom getting up at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I feel like I'm in high school again. And um, like on the weekends, you know, I would sleep in so late. And, um, and sometimes through the week <laughs> when I didn't go to school. Are you guys doing this senior challenge? Have you done a senior challenge? I'm thinking about doing it. Um, I just put, made a post-it note. I just made a post-it note. I just wrote on a post-it note in there, um, senior pictures. Because, like, everybody that I know is posting their senior pictures. So, I thought I would go through my basement and, like, find... Well, I have my senior pictures, but, like, I have my yearbook and I have everything down the basement. I have all of that. But I thought that I would find, um my senior pictures and then I would find like two or three pictures of like me and my friends from high school because I have like scrapbooks from back then and um I would I don't know I was like really I didn't I mean I didn't scrapbook like I didn't make them like real pretty or anything like that but I just put them all in like a scrapbook you know so I have those in my basement so I'm thinking about like taking like two of those pictures and putting them up there as well I thought that would be kind of fun to participate in that <laughs> I like to participate in things now. You know, I never did when I was, like, younger. So, like, I mean, I know it's corny to say that, like, participate. But, like, the 10-year challenge and, like, the senior picture shirt thing. Everybody's posting their senior pictures because, like, you know, for the graduating class of, like, 2020 and stuff like that. Um. Anyway. You know, I think it's real sad, like, that the kids can't graduate. I mean, I understand it. And, like, obviously it's a safety issue. But, like, for me... I got such horrible grades in high school. Um, my grades were really, really bad. And I know that people are like, a lot of people are like, well, you know, like the kids have worked so hard in their grades, you know, like they've worked so hard in their grades and their exams and all this kind of stuff that they don't get to have a graduation. And, um, 
And I totally, like, I feel for him. Although I have to say that it kind of surprises me a little bit. Like, some of my friends are, like, um, on Facebook, and they're like, I can't believe that my, my kid doesn't get to have a grad... I mean, like, not like, oh, it's sad, I can't believe it, but, like, complaining about it. And I'm like, well, what's the alternative? <laughs> like, your kid can't have spring break and prom. Like, we don't want to put them in harm's way, right? And, um... But it is sad. It is really sad. You know, I think that they don't get to have that. But it's really more the rite of passage more than anything else. I didn't go to my prom, so I could care less about the prom thing. <laughs> like, but I do know, like, there's a lot of people, like, I know some, like, our friend's daughter um, was really excited about going to prom and had, like, bought a prom dress. And um, she doesn't get to go to prom now. But I think she's a, I think she's a junior or sophomore. No. Because her brother is a, sen is a senior. This is Erin's daughter. She actually was in a couple booktube videos with me. Um, she's a sophomore. But, um... So, I think, like, that's all kind of sad and all that kind of stuff. But that's what I was going to say. Is it's, like, it's not just for the people that, you know, got straight A's and worked their butts off. I mean, graduation isn't just for them. I think the whole thing about graduation is it's such a rite of passage. I mean, you've been in school for 12 years, right? Most people have been in school for 12 years. And you're, like, I remember gradu... I mean, I remember the last day that, like, I was in school. I think we had exams that morning. And then... Like, seniors had, like, a half day, and then, like, sophomores and juniors had to go to school. And it was, like, a Wednesday. And I remember, like, sophomores and juniors had to go to school, like, Thursday and Friday, and then we graduated Friday evening. And if you live in Indianapolis, this is real interesting. So, there's a music pavilion that's, like, huge, right? And it's out in Noblesville, and I don't even know what it's called now. It used to be called Klipsch, and then before that it was called something else. And then, before that, it was called... It's changed, like, 50 million times. But the original... Well, that's not true. The original name was... Sundown Pro Productions or something like that. But when... The, most people referred to it back in the day as Deer Creek. Um, and it's, like, where the Grateful Dead played their last show. Before going to Chicago. Before Jerry died and stuff. And people, like, rushed the... Um, to get in, they, like, rushed the... Uh, what do you call it... Oh, shoot. The fences and things like that. And in Indianapolis, it was kind of like a legendary place. And it's where I went and saw all of my concerts back in the day. Like, I saw the B-52s there. I saw Dave Matthews for the first time. Grateful Dead. Um, Sade. Who else do I see there? Ziggy Marley. Farm Aid. I've seen so many. Marshall Tucker Band. Uh, I've seen so many. James Taylor I saw out there. Chicago. <laughs> that was like a really... A, I think it was James Taylor with Chicago. Like, not... They didn't play together, but like, you know. Um, that was like a bust of a concert. But I remember right to that. I've seen so many concerts out there. And it was like this place everybody used to go. Well, that's where our graduation was. Our graduation was at Deer Creek. <clears throat> and, um... So... Yeah, I don't know. I think it's... Oh, this is what I was going to say was... I remember that day, like... And, you know, like, you've heard me talk on here. Like, high school was not good for me. Like, I mean, I did not like physically going to high school. Now, my times of high school, my friends and the people that I hung out with, I had a really good time. You know, like, after 310 when the school bell closed and I was done for the day, like, my friends and I, I mean, I had a blast, you know? Like, smoking club cigarettes, smoking just regular cigarettes and hanging out and, you know, driving around, and we went out to dinner a lot when I was in high school, me and my friends, and we would just, like, drive around and listen to music. That's a lot of what we did, you know? And, um, you know, I had a good time in high school, and I can remember, it was the weirdest thing, like, you know, because I went to the same schools, kindergarten, all through high school. It was really, really important for my parents that I went to the same school system for all 12 years. They thought that it gave me consistency, right? So, it was one of the reasons why my mom stayed in the same house when I was growing up. Because my parents had decided... Is my hair, like, coming? I've been doing that all day. My parents had decided that it would be good for me to be in the same school system for all 12 years. To, like, make friends and whatever. It probably would have been better for me if I had, like, moved school districts. But, um... I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know that it would have really mattered. People weren't real open-minded, you know? And I was so effeminate. They were going to make fun of me no matter where I went. 
But, um, like, these people that I, like, paid very little attention to, you know, like, for years through high school that I had gone to, like, elementary and junior high with, people that I had been, like, friendly with in elementary and, you know, junior high, not maybe friends, but, like, we had been in classes, like, literally every year together and stuff, you know? I can remember, like, walking through the school, like, when we were done. Maybe we all had a half day that day. I think maybe we all had a half day that day. Like, the whole school, and then, like, the next two days, the sophomores and juniors just had half days on Thursdays and Fridays to finish their exams, and, like, everybody had half days or something. Because I can remember it being, like, mayhem, and, like, we were all, like, getting our stuff and, like, walking outside, right? Like, it was over. And I can remember seeing people... And I was like, like, this is so weird. Like, I could get real emotional about it right now. I can remember thinking to myself, like, I'm never going to see some of these people again. Like, it just, like, hit me like a brick wall. Like, literally, I was like, I'm never going to see some of these people again. These people that have literally formed my identity to some degree. Or, you know, these people that have sat next to me and I've seen them, you know, nine months out of the year for the last 12 years. Like, I'm never going to see them again in my entire life. Like, it was the most bizarre feeling, right? And, um... You know, I think one of the things that was really weird was I wasn't out in high school. And I know that, like, everybody thinks I was because I was so effeminate and whatever. But I wasn't out. I mean, I had people later come up to me and thank me for being out in high school because they were like, you made the process of me coming out so much easier. I was like, I wasn't out in high school, but whatever. You're welcome. Um, but I, um, I had this girl that was really, really popular. And... But very, like, unique looking and very different and, like, very cool. And um, one of her friends, I actually thought it was a prank. Like, one of her friends, like, two days before we gra like, got done with school came up to me and was like, so-and-so has had this huge crush on you for, like, three years. And um, she, and I've talked about this on here, like, a long time ago. I shared it, like, one time shared it, like, we're in a group setting or something. Um, <laughs> when you've ran group, like, when you, like, I used to, you know, run groups for years and years and years, and you say things like, do you want to share? You talk in that language forever, you know? But anyway, um, so this girl came up to me, and she was like, you know, so-and-so has had this crush on you for, like, three years, and has never, and she, and this was the other thing, she had a boyfriend in high school, too, that was, like, a football player, like, a real popular football player, and I think she ended up marrying him, um, and they're, like, divorced or something now, I don't know, but, um, or maybe she didn't, I don't know, but she, but her friend was like, it, like, it's a really, like, she has always wondered what would happen if you guys got together. And it was so weird because it was somebody that was, like, never on my radar. It was not a prank. I knew it wasn't a prank because of how she said it to me. And it was real private. And the girl just came up to me by herself. And, um... It wasn't, like, anybody that I really ever, like, I knew who she was because she ran with this group and she was so cool and kind of different that I had always kind of known who she was. But, like, it, she wasn't anybody that was, like, we never talked. I don't remember ever, like, in once in high school, like, ever having, like, any kind of, like, real conversation with her or anything. Um, and it just kind of came out of nowhere. And then, like, somebody else said something to me, like, the next day after that, like, another one of her friends, and was like, she's really freaked out. Like, she feels like she had this chance, you know, that she could have dated you in high school, and she never came up and talked to you, not one time. And, um, and I didn't really know what to do with it. I and mean, we were, like, such different groups, you know? I mean, it just it was a very pretty and pink kind of thing. Like, it just didn't make any kind of sense. And I remember she, somebody gave me a note from her. I probably still have it in my basement. And she basically just, like, poured her heart out to me. And was like, anyway, it was bizarre. And I think that kind of, like, like, screwed with my head a little bit at that time, too. You know, like all these what could what could have been in high schools. And you know, like I'm a person that really believes in I don't know if it's necessarily reincarnation, but I believe that we come back here 
to continue to learn things in our lives. Every psychic that I've ever seen, every psychic medium I've ever seen, and you all know I've seen a lot of them, right? Has told me this is my last life cycle. But this is the last time I'm going to be here. And I think to some degree, it's like... When you look at it from a perspective of understanding that, it kind of makes sense. When I was in elementary school, I remember the elementary school that I went to, um, I was a crossing guard. And... It was one through, it was K through five and kindergarten through fifth grade. And I remember that last day, I had the little crossing guard thing, you know? And so I remember I helped and um, then I had to go back inside and the school was empty. Everybody was gone and the teachers were like, you know, cleaning out their desks and rooms and stuff like that. And um, like, I remember going to the principal's office and like handing over my crossing guard thing and then like walking out and um, it felt so weird walking through the school and I knew I was never going to be in that school school again and I got so sad I remember just getting so sad like I'm never going to be in this school again um, and as much as I hated like being in elementary school like those were really really hard years for me as far as being bullied um, those were also really really good years for me I mean like I had some really good friends in elementary school um like girls, girls that would last to be, to be my friends for the rest of my life, some of them, um, just a few, not many. Junior high was horrible. Um, sixth grade was probably one of my best years out of all 12 years. It was the combining of like four or five elementary schools and, uh, and it was like this, like I was kind of like, I could reinvent myself and I had a lot of new friends. Um, and everybody was just like carefree and easy. Plus, sixth grade was isolated from the rest of junior high, so it wasn't like sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. It was like sixth grade, and then like seventh, eighth, and ninth. And so we were like isolated to ourselves, and it was just such a great year. And I remember the end of the year, like everybody taking pictures with each other. I still in my basement. I have like all these pictures from sixth grade, like tons. And everybody was taking pictures together on the last day of school. And I remember like signing yearbooks, and everybody was friends with everybody. It was the weirdest thing. I don't know how I like remember, but I mean, I don't. I don't remember specifics of like things other than like maybe a couple close friends of mine but like um I can just like from the pictures I can kind of like you know remember it and um our lockers were down like in this locker bay and they were all together and um it just was a really safe year for me and then I remember I came back in seventh grade and I had to have these two girlfriends in sixth grade not girl girl not girlfriend girlfriends but like just friends that were girls and that whole, well, one of them actually <laughs> was my girlfriend. She was my very first girlfriend ever. And, um, like official girlfriend. She and, up, she and I later would meet up in the rooms of, <laughs> of uh, recovery. And I always love to share whenever I see her <laughs> with all of our close friends that I was her first boyfriend. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, she's so funny today though. We're real good friends today. But, um, so she and the other girl, like, we were all, the three of us that whole summer were inseparable. Like, we stayed, stayed over each other's houses, and, um, we, like, went to water parks the whole summer. I mean, we literally were inseparable that entire summer. And that, I remember that, like, August, the one girl and her mom and my mom and I went to Chicago to go school clothes shopping and just go to Chicago for like a weekend. And um, I remember I came back and I went to seventh grade and it was night and day. And they didn't talk to me ever again. Like they literally did not talk to me ever again. Um, and I don't know what it was. You know, I don't know if they figured out like... I mean, seventh grade, people were ruthless to me. That was, like, probably... Seventh grade was probably one of my hardest grades ever. Um, and then eighth and ninth grade, I just kind of isolated into myself. And that's why I think my mom and I got so close my eighth and ninth grade year. So coming out of junior high, coming out of ninth grade, I was terrified to go into a high school. Like, I was absolutely terrified. I had heard horror stories... I didn't have any friends in high school. I mean, I didn't have any friends of mine that were in high school. I didn't know anybody in high school. 
I was terrified of going and I thought I was gonna, I literally can remember thinking I was gonna get my ass beat on a daily basis. And, um, and I remember Susie's daughter actually came to visit with Susie that summer. Um, I think, can't remember if it was before or after because we went to Beaver Island that year. And um, I can remember, I, was, I told her, I said, I'm really scared. And she's like, it's not that bad, you'll be fine. And I was like, I don't know. And I can remember thinking, like, I don't know where, if I'm going to be able to find my way around or my lockers or whatever. Like, I was really, really scared of it. And um, she was like, you'll be fine. And I look back on that now, like, high school, you know, like, with, like, a small environment it was. And, um... And it's so weird to me, you know, it's like... The whole idea of high school is so strange, I think, you know, or growing up and going to the same school system. So I know some people didn't, you know. I think part of it for my mom was that... She had changed schools so many times. So, my mom went to IPS schools, and that's Indianapolis Public Schools. And so, there's, like, School 61, School 42, School 30, you know, there's every, School 70, School 21. My mom went to, like, so many different IPS schools when she was growing up. And, um, because she moves so much. My grandma moves so much. But then when she got to high school, she kind of, like, they all came together, like, at the same high school. Because there was basically two high schools in Indianapolis at that time. And, um, like, on the north side of... Well, not... My mom didn't... She grew up in, like, the, the north central kind of area. Uh, well, there is a north central high school, but I don't think it existed when my mom was in high school. There was Broader Pool and there was Short Ridge. And, um... So you either went to Broader Pool or you went to Short Ridge. And so she knew everybody from Broader Pool and Short Ridge because she'd gone to all these schools. And my mom was kind of popular in high school anyway. And so was my aunt. So, like, they know... And I think part of it was they had gone to all these schools so they knew so many people, you know? So, I think for my mom, it was like, I want him to go to the same school system forever. Um, and I don't know. Like, it's so weird to me sometimes to this day, you know? Like, I think I... Well, I know. I definitely think about things on, like, a deeper level than a lot of other people do. I don't mean that, like, on a more intellectual level. I think what I, what I mean by that is I allow things... I, I like, think about... Th I put meaning to things that probably should have no meaning to them whatsoever. You know, like... I don't know. Like, I see people on Facebook, and, like... Like, it was interesting, because this guy tonight, he posted these pictures. And there were, like, four pictures from our high school yearbook. And he was, like, just randomly posting pictures to see who's actually watching or something like that. Because he was just, like, putting four random pictures. And this one guy was, like, such an asshole to me in high school. He was such a horrible asshole to me that he put this picture up. And I remember him. And he's super religious now. He, like, friended me at some point. I don't know why. Whenever anybody friends me on Facebook that I went to high school with, I just let him. I'm like, that's... You know what? I have tried to let go of that stuff. And so it is what it is. I don't have, like, I don't really truly, I really don't feel, like, any resentment anymore about it, even though it's been so long. And, you know, some people will say to me, like, well, why would you have any, you know, animosity after 30 years or any resentment after 30 years anyway? Well, you're talking about 12 years of almost daily abuse. Um, you know, I mean, I think that it, you can't explain it unless you've lived through it, you know? Um... There just became a turning point for me where I just was like, I don't want to be, um, I don't want my life to continue to suffer because, uh, because other people weren't kind to me. Like, then I'm continuing to punish myself, and there's no reason for that. But anyway, this guy, I'm, like, friends with him on Facebook, and he's always, like, posting, like, Bible scripture and, you know, like, all this kind of stuff. And, um... And, like, he's, like, this... He's always talking about, like, how he's turned around and taking, like... <laughs> saying stuff about, like, um, who he was in his past and making it right. And, like... And, you know, like, basically an amends process, but not, like, in a 12-step program, which I'm, like, all about. Like, hey, you know? Um, but I'm, like... 
Has it ever been on your radar, like, how bad you made my high school experience? Like, ever once? Like, did you did you think that was just nothing? That you, like, really negatively affected somebody's life? You know, so it's like, it's still there. Like, it still pangs me a little bit. Like, you know, whenever I see that stuff. Because I saw his picture come up and I just was like, oh, God. Him? <laughs> really? Don't get me started. It's like people really only want to do the work on themselves that they really want to do. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they want to do what's convenient, what's easy. So no, high school isn't just for the people that got the straight A's and high school isn't just for the people that had a great time and went to prom and went to the football games and the whatever. Graduation is for everybody because it's a rite of passage and it was a rite of passage for me even though I was terrified to go. I was scared to get death to go to graduation because I was afraid that when I walked across the stage somebody would yell the word that starts with an F and my mother would have to hear it and then she would know what I went through when I was in high school. And... um I was terrified of that, you know? But I still wanted to do it. It was my right to do it. I had earned it. Um, it's weird, like, have you ever seen the episode of Designing Women? And um, when she goes to her high school reunion. Did you ever wonder, like, on stuff like that, like, why they always went everywhere together? <laughs> I was thinking about that today because I'll tell you why in a second, but I was re referencing Jean Smart, who plays a Charlene on Designing Women. And I was like, every one of those episodes, they like, oh, I love Annie Potts so much. Every one of those episodes, they always like went everywhere together. Like if it was a reunion, they all four went. If it was a wedding, they all four went. Like it didn't matter that only one of them was invited, you know? But there was a reason why they were all there at the reunion. I can't remember what it was. They always made some excuse for why they were all there. But anyway, um, so uh, Delta Burke, who played, uh, oh shoot. Julia Sugarbaker is the other one. Why can't I think of what her name is? Oh my God, this is gonna drive me crazy. I love Delta Burke so much. Why can't, uh, Julia Sugarbaker, why can't I think of her name, what her sister's name was? Oh my God, I've seen literally every episode. I know people are like shouting it. It starts with an L. Um. Suzanne, and I didn't even get it up yet, but I know that that's what it was. Anyway, did you ever see the movie with her, the Lifetime movie, where she was a gambler, and that woman came up to her in the ca casino and pulled her out, her friend, she goes, I can't stop! I always tell Valerie that. <laughs> anyway, um, it's the episode where she goes to her reunion, and she gets the award for Most Changed. And they give it to her because she's gained so much weight. And if, if you've never seen it, um, I think it's the episode when Julia Sugarbaker goes into the bathroom and she hears that girl and she's like, and that's the night the lights went out in Georgia. Do you ever see that episode? I think that's the episode. But anyway, um, so she does this really sweet thing at the end of it. And she's like, uh, Suzanne does. And she's like, I know why you guys gave me the award for most changed, basically, because I've gained so much weight. And she was like, but I'll always see you the same way as, you know, the girls that, like, I cheered with and the boy who kissed me goodnight after a day on my front porch. And, you know, she just is talking about how she fondly looks back on those years. And, you know, I think for me... No matter what happened, no matter how hard it was, it's, you know, a period of time in my life that there were 670 of us that went through the same thing together for 12 years in a row, you know, consistently. And that I graduated with those 12, those almost 700 people, you know? That that was a time in my life, unlike any other, that we shared that period of time together, you know? It's gonna stop, hold on. 
Okay. We shared that period of time in our lives together. And, you know, like, I can be angry about it. Like, I've had friends of mine that are like, I could care less if I ever go to a high school reunion. I don't want to talk about high school. I hated high school. High school was horrible. But the reality is it was a huge part of my life. It really, really was. I don't want to live in it anymore. You know, I don't want to live in you know, 30 years ago, but will I go to the reunion? I hope that they have it still this year. I hope we're still able to go, you know? Will I continue to talk to people that I went to high school with? Sure, you know, like, um, I want to talk to all kinds of people from my past because they were in my life for a reason, you know, and I learned something from that period of my life, any period of my life, you know? And, um, I think one of the sad things about my life is that, like, whenever I have, like, an ending to something, like, it feels very finite, you know, like, um, when I left working in treatment, there were, like, six of us that had all, like, kind of started within, like, two or three years of each other, and we all left within two or three years of each other, and, and six of us that all left, and two that are still there. Um, in some capacity, but not the same capacity that they were when we were there together. One guy is doing, like, adult programming, and, like, uh, I don't know what the other person's doing. But it's completely, and, and then our supervisor, it's completely different, um, capacity. And, you know, I still talk to them from time to time. But it's nothing, like, I was, like, talking to Alex about this the other day, because he was saying, like, how weird it is for him that he's not seeing his co-workers that he spent so much time with, you know? And... I'm like, yeah, like, I used to always say that back in the day, like, we spend 40 plus hours a week with people, right? Like, when we work with them, whether we like them or not, and I have to say, like, I was blessed to have a team that I worked with that, like, I loved those people. Like, I loved them. I was there for 13 years. I loved them, you know? And, um, they were like sisters and brothers to me. Well, I mean, it was two guys. It was me and one other guy, and then the rest were women. But, you know, like, um, I loved them, you know? And still do. Would do anything for them. And, um, but, like, I can remember, like, all of us, like, you know, even the people that left me for me would be like, um, you know, like, oh, we're going to go and we're going to have dinner and we're going to have lunch and we would talk about all that kind of stuff. And we meant it. Like, at the time, we meant it. You know, but I think that you leave and, you know, you start new things and life takes over and then all of a sudden you realize that it's it's hard to keep up with that stuff, you know, and you just don't. And, um, you know, I remember I left in... So I left in the end of January and um, then my mom passed away in May. And I hadn't seen anybody that I worked with since then because of that. Like, my mom was sick. I was going to the hospital, blah, 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 whatever. And that's not true. That's not true. I had stopped in one time because um, the treatment program where I worked was right next to the hospital where my mom... It was next to my the hospital my dad worked at all his life. And it was... Um, my dad was really, really good friends with the addictionologist that was the medical director at the treatment center that I worked at. And... Um, but it was also right next to where my mom, my mom passed away in this hospital. And one, I think I stopped by there for lunch one day with everybody. But you know, like, um, and I would talk to people, but like, I wasn't talking to them as much as I had talked to them before. And I can remember, I like stood up to get the, give the eulogy and I looked over at the left in the back and it was like my whole team was sitting together in two rows. And... Um, I just completely just like, I just, it was a lot, you know, it was so nice to see them there and, um, and a couple of them I still keep in contact with today, but you know, that was it. like, we were younger then too. Like, you know, most of us were either <clears throat> getting in serious relationships or weren't. And then like most of the women got married and then got pregnant. And so you know, they're, like, having kids. Like, one of my coworkers actually, is, um, like, she's, like, eight months pregnant right now. I just saw that on Facebook. Like, I knew she was pregnant, but I didn't realize she was that pregnant. Um, but she was a lot younger than the rest of us. She kind of came in right before I left, like, a couple years. And, um, so, 
But like, you know, like most the people that I worked with, like when we started together, we were like young, you know? Um, I mean, I started there when I was 22, almost 23 years old. And is that right? Yeah. And most of ever, all of us did. I mean, we were all, I would say, between like the same age period, you know, with like three or four years. And um, so most of the women that I worked with had either just gotten married or were getting married. And then within my first five years, I would say the ones that had already worked there were get, having kids. And the, the five years after that, the ones, like, I mean, I was like in like three weddings or something, you know? So life goes on, you know, and there was kids soccer games and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And um, that's just kind of what happened. So, I don't know, you know, it's just weird. I will say, like, as a gay man that has primarily had friends of mine that were women in my life, I will say, like, the the kid thing is a lot of, like, what, ch like, marriage and kids is a lot of what, like, changes stuff, interestingly enough, because it's like, uh, and I totally get it, right? I mean, like, Tanya and I, <laughs> I can remember... Like, with Tanya, like, calling her and being like, hey, you want to go get a fountain pop or something like that or go to Target? And she'd be like, it's not like that change was, like, moving over there. That was so weird. And I'd be like, do you want to go to Target or Walmart or whatever? And she'd be like, um, oh, we've got to do, like, Wednesdays were always math nights. Like, they sat down and did algebra on, math, on Wednesday nights when Nick was growing up. And, um... You know, but she would have things that she had to do with him. And it was just like, I, you know, I would, but I was older, I think maybe I got it a little bit more. Um, but a lot of my friends, it's like, we're, we'll be really close. Like I'm seeing Alex go through this right now, actually. It's interesting because most of my friends are closer to my age, you know, like my recovery friends and stuff like that. Well, that's not necessarily true. I've got some friends of mine right now. One of my closest friends, her son is 10. Um, but, uh. But she's at home with him all day long, and so she can, like, I don't know. And, like, her husband's, like, real, they're married, and, like, real, he's real involved, too. So, um, but, like, a lot of, like, Alex's friends are, like, you know, they would go out all the time together, and they were always doing things, and let's do this, and let's do that. And now, like, you know, they're getting married, and they're settling down, and they're having kids, and they don't want to go out anymore, you know? Like, that's not fun for them anymore. It's not interesting. And that was, he's at the age where I was, where all of that changed. You know, and it's real interesting because he'll do, like, some of these, like, Zoom, like, little, like, you know, cocktail hours. And it's always, like, for these four girls that he, he has, like, two sets that he does it with, two different sets of friends. And it's always, like, these girls that are, like, all married, have their own houses, are into gardening and decorating, and they're having their kids. Like, you know, and there's some of their kids are, like, you know, 15 and stuff. And 11 and... Um, I think he's starting to experience the same thing. That was kind of hard for me. That was a hard period of my life when, um, you know, like I would invest in a friendship for like three or four years and then like my friend would get like married and, and, I, and it's not like I didn't understand it. Of course, I totally understood it. I was happy for my friends. You know, I wanted them to have these things, but they would get married and then they would get pregnant. And then like them wanting to talk on the phone until 10 o'clock at night was done. You know what I mean? Like they didn't want to do that anymore. And they didn't want to like, you know, go out to a cute brunch on a Sunday and like maybe like go out to a lounge. I mean, this is when I was going out a lot more too. It's hot in here. Um, go out to a loungy bar or something like that late at night. You know, like, they weren't into that anymore. So, and I totally get that. I understand that, right? But, like, every, like, ending that I've had in my life has been so finite that it has felt very much to me like it's the last time that I'm ever going to experience that, like, ever. Just weird Then when I've had all these psychic mediums tell me this is my last, like, last, like, life cycle. Kind of, like, goes along with that. But, I don't know. I don't know how I got onto all that today. But I'm going to do the senior picture challenge. That's where I started that. Um, okay, so let's talk, let's, let me tell you about my life. Are you ready? First of all, I vlogged for an hour, almost two hours last night. Hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> so today's not going to be that long. Um, I'm like looking at the clock right now. It's number one, because I started late. Number two, because I got to catch up on my words with friends <laughs> games before they expire. And number three, because I want to listen to a little bit of my audiobook. 
so I finished the uh, Butterfly Garden last night. I was actually surprised. I think it was a couple people on my booktube channel, but I could be wrong. S or maybe it was on my vlog. We're like, oh my God, the Butterfly Garden was so good. Mm, okay, I really struggled with it. I gave it three stars. Um, it was okay. The story idea felt very stolen to me from a mixture of Silence of the Lambs and James Patterson's um, by Thomas Harris and, and James Patterson's Kiss the Girls. It felt like it was those two books in one, all told from a very snarky 18-year-old's point of view. And she was unlikable as a character. And the FBI that was investigating her didn't sound professional, <laughs> like, whatsoever. Like, this one guy kept on getting mad at her but like foolishly mad and it didn't seem researched at all to me. I, it was fun to listen to just because it was kind of like you wanted to find out what was gonna go on next, but other than that, and the twist at the end of it was so dumb because I didn't even know the person that they were, I, I didn't really understand. She kept on referring to this person through the whole book and like, then there was like this twist with this person, but like the person meant nothing to me. So it was, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was ready for the book to be done. So, um, I finished that and then I started, and this is so good right away. It's so scary, you guys. It's called The Sundown Motel from Sim Simone St. James. And apparently she's written a couple books and they're like horror novels. Um, but this one is about this girl that in 1982 goes to work at the Sundown Motel and it's apparently haunted and all this stuff happens in the middle of the night and um, in Fell, New York. And then flash forward like 30 years or whatever, this other girl, her name is Carly, like this just flashes forward. Like I'm literally like in chapter two or something. I'm like 40 minutes into the book. Um, like, after her mom dies, she's, like, a true crime buff. And so she wants to go and, like, find out what happened to her, it's her aunt that went missing. This Vivian. Viv. Vivian. <laughs> so she wants to go and find out what happens to her. So she goes there to, like, find out. And that's what you're, where, where I'm at right now. She's, like, showing up there. But it's very spooky. It's, like, really, really good. I'm kind of living for it. Okay. And then, let me tell you, I just bought this book on Audible. I know I shouldn't have. And let me just tell you. Okay, I'm starting to kind of try to listen to longer books, and this book is 22 hours long. I shouldn't have picked it, but I had to, and let me tell you why. Because it was recommended on Audible. It was like books people are talking about right now, and it's called The Last Tribe. I want to read this to you guys, okay? Because I know you guys are going to be like, oh my god, that sounds like what we're going through right now. This is probably not the best book to ease my anxiety, but I was like, I'm reading this right now, I don't care. Um, who is it by? Hold on a second. Uh, oh, it is by Brad, it's by Brad Manuel. Okay, The Last Tribe. Oh, the cover looks really stupid, and it got bad ratings. It's 720 pages. What do people say? I'm, I may not be into this book. It's not, it, it got horrible ratings. <laughs> it's, it's all about this person has said the last tribe is a good is a po the last tribe is a post apocalyptic novel about meeting up, cooking and eating, cooking and eating, cooking and eating, and flying off into the sunset. <laughs> okay, so anyway, this is what it says. It's about though. Doesn't this sound so good? Um, imagine being alone in the world, one of only a handful to survive a global pandemic. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Not only do you struggle to find food, water, and shelter, you deal with the sadness and loss of everyone you know and everything you have. 14-year-old Greg Dixon is living that nightmare. Attending boarding school outside of Boston, he is separated from his family when a pandemic strikes. His classmates and teachers are dead, rotting in a dormitory turned morgue steps from his room. The nights are getting colder and his food has run out. The last message from his father is get away from the city and meet at his grandparents' town in remote New Hampshire. Knowing the impending New England winter could 
be the final nail in his coffin. He packs what little food he can find and sets off on his 100 mile walk north with the unwavering belief that his family is alive and will join him. As the fast moving and deadly disease strips away family and friends, Greg's father John is trapped in South Carolina. Roadblocks, the panic-stricken population, and winter make it impossible for him to get to his son. John and his three brothers appear to be immune, but they are scattered across a lockdown United States, forced to wait for the end of humanity before traveling to the mountains of New Hampshire. Spring arrives, and the Dixons make their way north to find young Greg. They meet others along the way and slowly form the last tribe of humanity from the few people still alive in the Northeast. Doesn't that sound so good, though? It got horrible ratings. <laughs> Horrible, horrible, horrible ratings, I have to tell you. Um, yeah. Not good at all. Uh, I don't know. But a lot of people are really happy that it doesn't have any zombies on it. And I was kind of like, I wanted to read a book like that anyway that doesn't have to do with zombies. I don't know why I'm weirdly attracted to this kind of stuff right now. Is anybody else, like the contagion kind of stuff, is anybody weirdly attracted to watching that kind of stuff right now? Okay, so, tonight for dinner, I ate way too much. First of all, I had two of these ginormous frozen, Alex has been eating them like crazy, and I can't believe he liked them. I bought tons of them, and um, they're horrible. I had them tonight, and this one I had to put this horrible cheese on it, or cheese on it to make it not taste so horrible and that didn't work and then the other one I put hot sauce on but I don't know what kind of bean I, I, I had bean and uh, cheese burritos they're hor it was horrible it was, ugh, it was gross um, and I baked them in the oven and everything and they still weren't right Alex was so funny. He goes, you don't bake those in the oven. I go, yes, you do. It says it right here. He goes, no, you steam them. I got you steam a burrito? What are you talking about? <laughs> I said, it says right here, you bake them in the oven. We're such cooks of the world. And he made chili because I got him a bunch of cans of chili, remember, back in the day? It's so funny. We forget what we even have in there. So I had two burritos and then for dessert, because <laughs> like I needed dessert, right? I had, I have these huge muffins from Costco. Have you guys had those? If you go to Costco, they have these chocolate chip caramel muffins there. They are literally the bombalicious, okay? You cut them in half and you put butter all over them and then like, and then you melt them in the microwave for 45 seconds. But I will tell you something. I got this plant, this plant-based butter because they didn't have any other butter when I went to the grocery store the last time to get butter. So I got this plant-based butter, which is whatever, you know? But, like, it will not melt in the microwave. Like, it's the weirdest thing. It does not melt. It's so strange. So, anyway. Um, but, like, yeah, that was my dessert. And then I was just, like, so full. But we watched the last episode of season one of The Handmaid's Tale in the first episode of season two of The Handmaid's Tale. Okay, now I have to tell you something. So, I was talking to my friend today. Um... And she was telling me, like, she, I was telling her that I was watching it, right? And um, she was like, okay, when you get to, well, first of all, we both love Kate Bush. If you've never, if, if you don't know who Kate Bush is, I don't know if she's still making music, but back in the day, I loved her. And she does this, she's two songs, a Running Up the Hill, Running Up That Hill, and This Woman's Work are like two of my favorite songs of life. And this friend of mine knew that. And she goes, in episode one of season two, there's a scene to this woman's work and you're gonna die when you see it. And I literally was like bawling my eyes out watching the scene. Handmaid's Tale is so good. The thing is though, like tonight, like I was watching it, like it is so beautifully shot. I mean, it is unbelievably beautifully shot. It is just a beautiful, beautiful show to watch. Um, so we watched that and we ate dinner and then I said to Alex, what are you going to do? And I said, I've got to lay down for a little bit. And he was like, okay, I'm going to watch another episode, but he didn't. He told me he ended up watching. I can't remember what he said he ended up watching. But, um, what else? So I got up today and made my coffee and did all my stuff in the morning that I do, you know, like that. And then got up the vlog. I was like, I can't believe this vlog is an hour and 15 minutes when I like uploaded it last night. I had no idea how long it really was. It kind of surprised me that it was that long. Um, so I uploaded that 
and then I made my coffee, and then I talked to some friends, and then I started making my videos, and I made a video on every one of my channels today, and I was like really happy that I got to get back to doing that today. I was like, okay, I'm like feeling it, I'm feeling my mojo, I'm ready to go, did all that. Um, and then tonight, I had, um, we started, so there's Tanya and I, and our sponsor, there's eight of us total in this group. And, is that right? Yeah, there's eight of us total in this group. Then this other friend of ours and her daughter and then this girl that I didn't know until tonight. And we are doing, like we're reading literature, um, like 12 step literature, and um, through a Zoom call. Oh man, it was so nice. It was so it was so fantastic and powerful. And um, you know, because it was like this really small private thing and we almost all of us knew each other. People were shared really private stuff. Like we would read part of the book and then we would share stuff. And um, so we were talking about, you know, the first step tonight and um, which is, you know, men love, we are powerless. And that our lives have become unmanageable, manageable. And um, so each person was kind of sharing like what got them in. And what was interesting was I couldn't find, um, so I don't want to talk about what specific book this was, but like, so I always have like the basic text behind me because I always have mine inside and then I have an extra in case like somebody needs one and then I just give it to them. But th this was another piece of literature that we were reading and I couldn't find it, so I had to use my mom's, okay? Well, my mom's is so highlighted and underlined and I mean, it's crazy, right? So I'm reading from her book, but what was interesting was that my mom had up actually probably done a workshop with this at some point because she had like written dates, like when she had done this. And I was talking about like, my mom had bought the book. She had it written in the top, in the front of the book. She had it written in pencil and then she had it erased, but I could still see it. It had her name. And then it said, uh, December of 1992. Well, what's interesting about that, okay, is that my mom's sobriety date was June 2nd of um, 95. So she had bought this book three years before she had gotten sober. And, um, I could tell because when you buy literature from meetings, like they do something, spe like the price is like written inside usually with like pencil or whatever. And I could see the price had been written in there with pencil. And I was like, so my mom was going to meetings in 92. Now I knew that she had gone around and tried some meetings, but I didn't know that she was like going in and getting literature and things like that. And it's so crazy when I think about like, all the times my mom started and she couldn't, you know, stay stuck and, you know, she would keep a calendar and she would write on the calendar like, you know, like day one, day two, day three, day four, or she would put like two glasses of wine or, you know, like one martinis for two and she would write on this like a calendar, you know, like you like fold open and you like hang on the wall, that kind of calendar. She would like write on there like how many drinks she had had until she was trying to quit, like, you know? And I used to do that, like, for my, uh, when I first got sober, I kept a calendar of, like, how many days I had been sober. Like, I counted every single day for two years. And, I mean, I could tell you everything. Now we have apps for that, but back then we didn't have apps. And I counted, like, every day I would get up and I would write on my calendar, like, you know, 242 or 65 or 64 or whatever, you know? 30, 31 or 32, you know? And she would try to, like, she would write that down. So I was like, I wonder how long my mom really tried to stay, get sober before she actually did in 95, you know? She had the literature before, I didn't know that. And I knew that she had come in through Al-Anon because my mom was listening to a meeting in Al-Anon um, and somebody was talking and sharing their story and, you know, Al-Anon is a 12-step program for friends and family members of alcoholics and addicts. Well, alcoholics. And my mom was like, this woman's talking about me. Like, I need to be, you know, in a different program. And, um, my neighbors just got up at 4, 4.53 in the morning. Their lights just went on. Um, so it was so nice. It was just was so pure. And we were each sharing, like, our stories of when we realized we were powerless and um, 
you know, we were talking about like trudging the road of happy destiny and like, if I could admit that I were like, you know, I mean, in the literature, it says that if I could admit that I was powerless, then the world was mine, you know, that I could have anything I wanted as long as I was willing to surrender to that powerlessness and just say, I can't do it anymore, you know? But then I had to be willing to do the work. And um, was I willing to do the work, you know? And so we were just having, we had a fantastic conversation. I got off the dinner. I felt just like so full of spirit and I felt so hopeful. It just was so nice. And then I called Tanya and we were like laughing about some stuff. And so my friend, the one that has the, uh, the 10 year old son and um, so her husband, um, they, <laughs> he, does like zoom meetings for work right so he like will be <laughs> just like my mouth just started itching thinking about this because we got laughing so hard about this i think i may have talked about this on here the other night so she he was in there the other morning or something and she came in to ask him if he wanted something some coffee or something like that and um he like turned around real quick and looked at her and he goes when the, when the door is closed that means I'm working or some, or I'm in a meeting or something like that and she got laughing so hard and so she sent him this gif I have it actually on my phone um <laughs> it's so funny okay where is it at <laughs> If the door is closed, I'm live. And it says Britney Spears. Um, can you guys see it? I don't know if you can see it. But she like... <laughs> and she made him this gift. <laughs> and so we were like... Um, so I was like, oh God, it's like out of focus. Come on now. Focus on me. Focus. Focus. Can you focus? Come on. Come on, don't do this to me. Hold on. It's like magic. Anyway, so her son came in and so I sent her I sent her that gift. And we got laughing so hard and Tanya later said when I was talking to her on the phone, she was like, she can't hold it in as well as you can. Because, like, I can send it and be, like, funny and be like, like, I have no problem just, like, you know, keeping my face, like, poker straight, you know? Having, like, a poker face. And Tanya's like, you can't be doing that because everybody was, like, um, they knew that you, that she was laughing at something that you sent her. They knew that. And I go, Tanya, nobody knew that except for you because you know that she and I just, like, tease each other like that. And I go, and second of all, I go, you should have been having your eyes on the book. Why were you worried about what we were doing and you were looking at us in the Zoom? And Tanya started laughing so hard. She goes, yeah, I was getting kind of bored. She goes, listen, she goes, it was fun to listen to it and talk. She was like, but I just couldn't follow along in the book. She was so funny. <laughs> But it was great. And I said, wasn't it good? And Tani was like, yeah, it was so, it was exactly what I needed. It was so fantastic. It was so nice. I feel so, you know, like so blessed and honored to have my recovery peeps while I'm going through this, saving my life right now. So anyway, did that. And that was kind of my day. I had a good day. I had a real good day. My bank called me today. I thought this was real interesting. My bank called me today. And um, it was this girl that's always like works. I think she might be the manager. But I don't have to worry about her uh, hearing about this. Because she obviously doesn't know that I make YouTube videos. Because she called me and she said, Hey Peter, we haven't seen you come through here in a while. I went through last week one time. I think it was last week or the week before. And she said, um, I just wanted to make sure that you're doing okay while we're all, you know, to stay at home and whatever. She goes, I know you're a hairstylist. Because I always say to her, like, when I'm going through there, I'm always like, oh, I love your hair. She's got, like, real choppy hair, you know? And I'm always like, oh, your hair looks cute. Did you just get your hair colored? Or she's, every day I come in there, her hair's a different color, different style or something, right? And I'm always like, oh, your hair looks so cute. So she goes, I know you're a hairstylist, so you're probably at home. We're just wanting to check and make sure that you're okay. I thought that was so nice. Hold on, it's going to stop. I thought that was so nice, but I was like, I wonder why they think I'm a hairstylist. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, I don't have anything against it. I love hairstylists, but I'm not one.
<laughs> did you ever see that Roseanne where she's like, um, she kisses Mariel Hemingway and then everybody thinks she's a lesbian and she, cause she goes to the gay bar with Sandra Bernhardt and she's like, you know, it's like, I'm not an astronaut. Like I, it, 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 it's great if you're an astronaut, but I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> and she does the whole thing. Have you guys seen that? <laughs> oh man. Okay. So let's talk about something. Mel and I yesterday, oh my God, I'm so excited about this. So Mel and I talked yesterday and we wanted to do something really fun for May. So May, you know, is the beginning of, for Mel, who is my co-partner in the True Crime Book Club, with the period at the end of it, all lowercase. You can find it on Goodreads or you can go to my booktube channel. It's linked below all of my channels under there. I just did a video today about my big announcements and I listed everything. So anyway... Um, I said, oh, and here are the covers, and guess what? I didn't put the covers of the books in there, but it doesn't really matter. So, anyway, um, we got such a good reception from the Tiger King live stream. Like, so many people were, like, really, really loved that we did that. That we were like, well, why don't we do, like, it started kind of like, well, we could do another documentary and a book that go to, like, go hand in hand together, right? And Mel has suggested... Is this our third year? This is our second year. Is, uh, this is our third year. You know what? We just missed our anniversary and she did not even know. No, it's coming up. I think our anniversary is coming up. I think it's like April 20th or something. Pee-Pee's birthday is 422. I think his birthday might be... Yeah, anyway. Little guy. I really missed him today. So, um... Um, what was I going to say? Okay, so Mel suggested last year that we do a woman for the month of May in honor of Mother's Day. I know, right? Like a serial killer woman. And we were going to do Sylvia Likens. Do you guys know who she is? Like, I think she might even be from Indianapolis. Um, hold on a second. I don't know anything about this woman, but apparently... Mur oh, no, Mur Murder of Sylvia Likens. So she's the one that was killed, I guess. The murder of Sylvia Likens was a child murder which occurred in Indianapolis, Indiana in October of 1965. Likens, age 16, she was close to my mom's age, was held captive and subjected to increasing levels of child abuse and torture committed over a period of almost three months by her caregiver, Gertrude Banaszewski. Many of children, many of Banaszewski's children and several other neighborhood children before ultimately succumbing to her injuries on October 26th. Um, I wonder where that house is. I wonder if anybody knows. Sylvia, Sylvia Likens house. I feel like house address. Ooh, let's see. There it goes. <gasps> I've driven by there a million times. It's on New York Street. Oh my God, Sylvia Likens' death house. This is right by downtown. Well, this is it is downtown, but it's like right by the university or IPY. Okay. Oh my God, that is so creepy. Oh my God, I cannot believe that. She was the third child of carnival workers, Betty and Lester Likens. Oh my God, that's so sad. Okay, well, we're gonna read something about that, but that's not what we're doing for May. For May, we decided, are you ready? That we are dedicating the entire month of May to Eileen Warnos. And Eileen Warnos is a serial killer that I have been obsessed with for, mm, I don't know, 30 years of my life, 20 years of my life, something like that. She was a serial, oh, I just poked my eye. <laughs> Ouch, that hurts so damn bad, ow. She was a serial killer in Florida, and um, she killed seven men, and she was sentenced to seven 
um, executions. I think seven death penalties in the state of Florida, or six death, death six death penalties in the state of Florida. Be fine, finally being executed, and I think two thousand and two. I found out about her um, because I had watched the two documentaries that used to be on Netflix, but I like rented them at the, at the Blockbuster years ago that were called like The Life and Death of a Serial Killer and The Selling of a Serial Killer. They are now on Amazon Prime, okay? They're not on Netflix anymore. And then they made um, the movie Monster out of the book and it was with Charlize Theron, and she ended up winning um, an Academy Award for it, playing Eileen Warnos. And um, so, anyway, I just became very, very intrigued with her case. Like, she was such kind of a in-your-face. She just was so, like... It just, the whole story was so ridiculous to me. Like, she killed these men. She truly believed it was self-defense. Like, she had such mental... Um, she had such uh, mental health issues, like huge mental health issues. On, and then also had addiction issues. And she had been like abused when she was growing up and um, kicked out of her house. And she like lived in the woods. As an adult, she had like all of these people that like from her girlfriend to this woman that when she was incarcerated, adopting her and like just to get money from like her name. She had all these people that just constantly used and abused her. And I always felt, to some degree, like, watching stuff about her, that she was a product of our society. Like, I always wondered, you know, like, with the correct mental health treatment and addiction treatment and people to love her, would Eileen Warnos maybe not have turned out the same way? You know what I mean? By the way, somebody mentioned the Betty Broderick movie the other day on Lifetime, and yes, that was a fantastic Lifetime movie, by the way. I, I would like to watch that again. I haven't watched it in a long time. I actually remember that the woman that played Betty Broderick was the mom in Family Ties. I don't know how I remember that, but... Um, if you don't know who Betty Broderick is, she killed her ex-husband and his wife because it was good for her children. <laughs> because they would be much happier that way. <laughs> they have never spoken to her since, I don't think. Anyway. She was nuts. And when my mom would ever get, like, mad, like, at my dad, which was very, very rarely, I would always call her Betty Broderick. <laughs> she did not like it. So, anyway. Um... I'd be like, Mom, you sound just like that Betty Broderick because we had seen her like on Oprah, you know, when I was like, I don't know, 20 or something. I don't know when Bro Betty Broderick killed her family. I should look it up. So anyway, it doesn't matter. But we're, so for, I always wondered like what would happen. You know, like Eileen Warnos, I think is an interesting case. Like, I think there are a lot of serial killers that when we look at them, like, like you're just, it seems that they were born that way, you know? But then she's somebody that... Like, you even see, like, interview clips of her mom. And then she had this friend, Dawn. And so, what we're going to do for the month of uh, May is we're going to read this book called Dead Ends. And it looks real cheesy. I'm just going to tell you right now. But it was the best thing we could find. There are literally no good books about Eileen Warnos out. Except for the book Monster, which they based the movie on. Um, but I don't know, like, we couldn't find, oh, Mel couldn't find it at her library, and I couldn't find it on something else, so we were like, no, we had to pick one book that we could find everywhere, and Mel could find Dead Ends at her library, but what we're gonna do is, you can watch, De or you can read Dead Ends, that's the main book, and then the secondary book is this book called Dear Dawn, and it is all of Eileen Warnos's personal letters to her best friend growing up, this Dawn, and she wrote them to her from prison, and, um... And it really gives you, like, insight into... Go watch my booktube video. I read the explanation of it today. But it really gives you an insight into who Eileen Warnos was as a person. And, um... Is my battery... It's getting low. It really gives you an idea of who Eileen Warnos was as a person. And then we're going to watch the documentaries. And then we're going to watch Monsters, a movie. And you can watch any YouTube video. You can watch anything you want to watch. Read any articles or whatever. And we're just going to have a blanket conversation about Eileen Warnos. Um, but those are all of the different things that we're going to do and use. And anybody can, like, make suggestions about, you know, oh, we should read this. Or we should, you know, watch this documentary. Or we should watch this YouTube video. And um, so that's what we're going to do. And I'm real excited about that. Because I love talking about Eileen Warno. She is probably my favorite serial killer to talk about because she's so interesting to me as just, a, I don't know, as like a product of our society. As far as like, you know, serial killer, she's just my favorite serial killer to talk about. She's the most interesting to me. I think she's the most complex. 
Um, oh, and there's also a movie, this is what was making me think of it, with Gene Smart, who played Charlene in Designing Women, and it's called, God, I just looked it up earlier today, Road of Fury or something like that? No, that's not right. I thought it had the word for Fury in it. Misha, I think, is the one that told me this. Um, Gene Smart, and it's on YouTube, this movie is on YouTube. Gene Smart, um, Eileen... I tried to start watching it and it was so bad, you guys. It's called Overkill, the Eileen Warnow story. It's really bad. Um, oh, Park Overall in it. And she plays her girlfriend, Tyria Moore. I totally forgot about Park Overall. Whatever happened to her? Um, what was she in that I loved Park Overall in back in the day? Um, Do you guys remember her? Let me see what she was all in. What would have been the one movie that would have made me... 15 and Pregnant with Kirsten Dunst. Wasn't that it? Um, what was the movie that I would have loved her in? I remember her name for some reason. What was it? None of these are anything that are making me think of her. None of these. <laughs> what was she in? Was she in a TV show or something? Lost Angels? Maybe it was that? Park Overall. What was she in? Why do I know that name? I'm like looking at all... Mississippi Burning is about the only thing that she was in that makes me... The Vanishing? Oh, that was such a good movie. Like, I watched her in something. She was so fantastic in it. Empty Nest. I never watched Empty Nest. I thought that show was stupid. God, that show was on TV for almost 10 years. Did you know that? Anyway, that is what we are doing for May. And I'm very, very excited about it. And that's how we're starting off the summer of serial killers with a bang. Are you excited? It's going to be so good. I know you can't wait for it. Anyway, my throat is itching so bad from allergies. I'm so over it. Can you hear that I'm kind of like loose? And not only that, but it like, okay, it like says it's 43. So people were telling me that like, if I'm sitting here and my car isn't moving anywhere, it like warms up around there. So that's why it says the temperature is one thing. Somebody else said that the temperature inside is like inside the car is what I'm, no, it's 75 <laughs> inside the car. And it says right here, 43 out. <laughs> I'm reading that right there. Um, I read every comment earlier. I went through every single comment today. That's one thing I did. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, the weather. The weather is so nasty, you guys. Like, it was cold today, and it wasn't, like, really rainy, but, like, it was, like, sprinkling at times. And it's just, it's like, I think the up and down with the weather, it's 31 right now, and there's a freeze warning, and it says it's 43. It's so nasty outside. And then, let's see, tomorrow, it's supposed to be 43. 47, 41 on Friday, my God. And then it kind of warms up to the 50s and then the 60s, but not really. I mean, like the end of the month, it's supposed to be like 60 to 62. I don't know what it usually is in April. Maybe it's not that warm until the end of May. I guess it really isn't, is it? We're at the state. I was talking to somebody. I think it was Mel. Our stay-at-home order is through the 20th. And I think most people's is through the end of April, and I'm wondering, like, if they're going to keep us on a stay-at-home order through the end of April. I really, to be honest with you, I haven't watched the news in the last couple weeks, or the last couple days. Like, um, you know, like, I'll just kind of, like, quickly check the news stuff to see, like, if there's any new things that we need to know. But other than that, I haven't like really been like going in and like reading all the articles about the numbers and it just, it really gets me down. And I'm just kind of like, tell me what to do. 
tell me how to stay hopeful, you know, tell me like what I need to do to stay safe and healthy and um, what I can do to contribute positively. Other than that, like I don't want to hear about all of like it just it, it starts really really getting me down. And um, so I there's like certain like websites that I go to like I go to the Indiana government government one for the updates. And then there's a news station that I go to. Um, but like, it just like, it gives like bullet points, you know? And then I like, I'll read that. So I don't know. I don't think they've changed it though. Um, or we'll see. Indiana stay at home order. Oh wait, Indiana stay at home order extension. What is today? Okay, this was on the sixth though. What is today? Okay, any stay home order was extended Friday for two more weeks. This is okay. That's I think the twentieth. This one. So. Yeah. Text effect Monday, April 6th at 11.59. It ends Monday, April 20th at 11.59. But that's like a week from today. Or a week from yesterday. Yeah, it's a week from today. So. I can't imagine that they're gonna, um allow us to go out, you know, like, next Monday? I mean, I don't know. It'll be strange. I haven't really heard anybody say anything that they know otherwise. But, like, schools were canceled for the rest of the year. So, I just kind of expected that, that we would probably be in a stay-at-home order through May. I really did. If they lift a the stay-at-home order ban next week, I will be blown away. Like, I will be really surprised. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's different from state to state, isn't it? But I think most, um, don't almost all states have a stay-at-home order now? Um, search tools. Here, let's look in the last 24 hours and see if there's any updates. Okay. Okay, wait. Well, here's two different things. Someone predicts, Lightfoot predicts extension of stay-at-home order announces programs, and the next one is Holcomb hints at, that's our governor, at po possibly loosening of Indiana stay-at-home order next week. Hmm. If the numbers go down is what they're saying. The number of okay. I wonder why one says one thing and the other one says something else. Do you hate that? And then you like you. Oh wait. Oh, this is Chicago. I don't have anything to do with Indiana. That's probably why. Anyway, what do you think is gonna happen? I guess we don't know. We just do what we're told and try to stay hopeful for the best, you know? I mean, it doesn't really, to be honest, like, it doesn't really change my life a whole lot, except for that I can go out and get Starbucks and drive around and all that kind of stuff. But I can tell you, like, I, I, I don't know how comfortable I'm going to feel, like, going into places and stuff still. I probably won't. I mean, my life's going to... The only thing that'll be different is that I can, like, drive around, <laughs> you know, like, and, I don't know, listen to my audiobooks and, um, yeah, and vlog driving around. I guess it's really all it's going to change for me. Alex will go to work, you know, but other than that, um... I don't know, like, I can't, it just isn't going to change a whole lot for me, so, 
I don't know. I'll be. I kind of, the thing that's. I'll kind of miss him being at home. I've kind of enjoyed having him at home. Um. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, he needs to work, but I'm gonna miss him being at home. So anyway, um, I think I'm gonna get off here now. I actually vlogged for like an hour and 20 minutes, so I'm gonna get off here. Um, <laughs> that's, that's like a long vlog compared to back in the day. When I started this, it was like 12 minutes long. Do you know that? It's like it's gotten longer and longer over time. But anyway, it's almost easier for me to go longer just sitting here in the driveway than it is driving around. I don't know why that is, but I'm gonna listen to a little bit of my book and catch up on my words with friends, and I'm gonna start upload or rendering my vlog right now, so it'll be up and ready for for you guys tomorrow. So anyway, I'm gonna go through my uh, outro real quick for you tonight, okay? Anyway, I hope you guys are having an amazing, what is tomorrow, Tuesday? I hope you're having, oh, I have my home group meeting tomorrow on Zoom. <laughs> I hope you're having, Alex has um, a cocktail party at seven and I have my meeting at eight. That's how we roll in my house. <laughs> anyway, um, he doesn't have a cocktail party. It's like he's, the girls are getting together on the Zoom tomorrow night. Anyway, I hope you guys are having an amazing Tuesday unless you have other plans, but like I always say, don't have other plans. Make the most of your day. Um, do something really fun today. Do something that will make your... Excuse me. Do something that will make yourself proud when you look back on it tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, or 60 years from now, or 69 years from now. Family friendly. And if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. Make sure that you look at yourself in the mirror every single day and you do one positive affirmation and uh, at least one. You can do 20, whatever. Tell yourself one good thing and... Um, Today, look in the mirror and tell yourself things are going to get better. Things are going to turn around. And 2020 is going to be a really, really good year. And um, and also tell yourself that today is going to be a fantastic day. And if you're watching this when you go to bed, the first thing you should do when you get up in the morning after you go to the bathroom is you should look in the mirror and tell yourself today is going to be a really, really good day. And just believe that all day long and have that, you know, that positive attitude. And uh, let's see. Most importantly, make sure that you reach out to somebody and let them know how much they mean to you and just say, hey, I just want to let you know I'm thinking of you, I love you, and you mean the world to me, and thank you for being in my life. Or whatever you want to say. Hey, just, you know, like, hey, neighbor, <laughs> it's good to see you. It's nice to have you as a neighbor, you know, anything. And, uh, yeah, and also practice random acts of kindness, and don't forget, don't tell anyone. We just do it because it's the right thing to do, and it, it's putting good in positivity, putting good, it's putting good out there in the world, it's putting positivity out there in the world, and it makes us feel better inside, right? Um, thank you guys so much for watching this vlog and for watching every single night. Thank you for giving me a place to come and talk and just allowing me to be. And I just really appreciate it. It means the world to me that you guys are over here and you're watching every single day and listening to it. And, um, all of the messages and emails I'm getting from you guys talking about how I'm really helping you through this time right now. And all the people that are getting sober and staying sober and saying that my vlogs are helping them during this time. It just it, it's so heartfelt to me. And um, I want you to know I, I appreciate all of you guys out there and I love you. And um, yeah, it just each and every one of you means so much to me. And I really, really appreciate you guys watching this and giving me a place to come and hang out in the driveway and have a Diet Coke, a Fountain Coke. Anyway, I love you guys and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya!